Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. very compelling evidence that we uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. flight characteristics appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Arrow is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. Um, before we bring on my guest, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's here watching this live anyone on YouTube that watches it afterwards, and anybody on the Anomalous Podcast Network. Thank you so much. Also, I just wanted to suggest to anybody that hasn't seen it already uh, to go and check out, check out Tim McMillan's article over on the thedebrief.org. Um, a, a bombshell article today. I highly recommend everybody going to read it. Um, for everybody that is watching this live, if you could please keep things respectful and clean in the live chat, that would be much appreciated. There's no need for any abuse or any negativity. I mean, you know what I'm trying to say. I'd really appreciate that. If you have any questions for Rick today, please leave them in capital letters. Then I get to see them or I've got more chance of seeing them. Um, and all questions, we'll, we'll try and ask them if they're relevant to the conversation point that we're talking about. If not, they will be left till the end of the interview. I think that's it for now, guys. So uh, please let me welcome our guest, Rick Doty. Rick, how's it going? Good, Vinny. Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate very, you taking the time. Welcome. You're very welcome. So I think before we get like into the main main interview, Rick, if you could just give us a brief background on on your yourself, your career, that would be a great start. Thank you. Well, I'm Richard Doty. I worked for the United States Intelligence Service from 1978 to 1988. I was uh, worked for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations as a counterintelligence officer. Uh, I worked uh, at various locations, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base, which is in, near Albuquerque, New Mexico. And then I worked at Area 51, both at the, uh, within the Nellis Test and Training Range. Uh, there's two bases out there. One is Groom Lake Air Force Base, and the other is Tonopah Air Force Base. I worked at both of those. I had access to highly classified information per, per, <clears throat> pertaining to UFOs and the United States government's uh, program uh, investigating the, the phenomena of uh, UFOs. We call them UFOs back in those days, not UAPs. And there's other terminologies I'm sure we'll discuss later uh, regarding that particular program. Um, I worked right up until 1988 and I got out and I worked for a number of different uh, uh, companies, uh, one being the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin. It's Dr. Putoff's organization. I worked there for 12 years. And after that, I uh, 
I worked as a private consultant on movie sets. I've been doing that for about uh, 10 years. And I've also have uh, a, a number of uh, YouTube videos and so forth that I've done over the years. But that's that's my background. Before before I got in U.S. intelligence, I was in college. Um, and before that, I was in a regular Air Force. I served four years in the United States Air Force, got out, went to college, and then came back in working for United States Intelligence. Lovely. That's Thank pretty you much so in much. a nutshell. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so at what point did the UFO top topic or subject come into your career? Was it just suddenly on your desk one day? No, actually, yeah. Actually, that's exactly how it happened. Um, there was an incident that happened at Kirtland Air Force Base in 1979, early 1979, uh, where a, uh, a security guard had witnessed a uh, landing of a craft out in a restricted area on the base. At that point, I wasn't, I wasn't briefed into any special programs. And these special programs are called special access programs or SAP. Uh, when I started investigating it, uh, I realized that uh, it probably involved something that I hadn't been briefed into or that the government knew and I didn't know. So I asked my supervisor. I briefed him on what I was investigating. Uh, then he uh, sent me over to a special location on the base whereby I got a, a special briefing, a special access program uh briefing on the subject of UFOs and, and the United States government's involvement with UFOs. And that briefing occurred uh, in uh, 1979. It was about a two and a half hour briefing. It was by an Air Force colonel. I was shown a, uh, I, I wasn't the only one in the room. There were uh, some other people in the room, I think 10 or 12 other people that were being briefed in the same program I was. Uh, we were so, shown a video uh, United States government video or a, a movie and what we did in the videos and a movie, a 16 millimeter projector movie, uh, which included uh, uh, part of a recovery uh, operation that occurred uh, near Roswell in 1947. Uh, and then we were briefed on what the United States government has been doing from 1947 on. And that's when I realized that we uh, had a captured UFO in 1947. We found another one in 1949. We had a live alien uh, from 1947 to 1952 when he died. And I was also briefed in other uh, crashes that, that occurred after that. So I was briefed into the program which had assisted me in the investigation of the incident that, are, that happened on the Kirtland Air Force Base in an area called Coyote Canyon. And that's, uh, that's my beginning. Excellent. I mean, you've already said there about crashes and alien bodies. I mean, that must be like highly classified information. So how is it that you're able to freely talk about it so easily? It was at that point. At, back in those days, um, and this is set in 1979, uh, it was classified. It was highly classified back then. Uh, but over the years, that information's leaked. Uh, uh, almost, uh, not everything, but uh, a lot of information that the government had tied up in a special access program has le been leaked or been spoken about. And then I had a non-disclosure statement uh, uh, agreement with the uh, government when I got out in 1988, but that expired. Now, there are certain things that I won't talk about, but the mere fact that we had uh, two ca captured uh, UFOs back in those days uh, that I knew about that I was briefed into, and one live alien that uh, we found at a crash site near Corona, New Mexico, or, or people call it the Roswell crash. Actually, the crash, the actual craft crashed near Corona, New Mexico, which is north, about 70 miles north of Roswell. And then the second craft we found out west of there near Horse Mason, New Mexico in 1949. Um, Though, all that information has been released. Uh, the Roswell, uh, uh, the number of books of, uh, regarding the Roswell incident, but few people get have have it all right. I mean, Stan Friedman had it right, and some other people have had it right. Uh, there, and then there's some books out there that have it completely wrong. But I was briefed into the official program. I know what officially happened, and I'll just uh, accept what the government told me what happened. 
Fair enough. Yep. Can't, can't argue with that. Um, now, it said that OSI spied on civilian UFO researchers, even breaking and entering homes and feeding them disinformation. Can you tell us about that and why they felt the need to go to such lengths? Were, were they getting close to the truth? What was the reasons behind all that? Well, the United States government has such a thing as a counterintelligence network around uh, vital inst installations. Uh, and believe it or not, the, the, the British MOD, uh, MI5 and MI6 has exact same program as we do. In fact, uh, I sat in a room uh, many, many years ago with uh, MOD people uh, who, uh, and, and I'm sure most of you know that the, the Ministry of Defense has a counterintelligence a, a part. Uh, they, they have it. And, 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 the, and the object of that is protect the installations, just like we, we have to protect our military installations in the United States. And one of the, way, one of the way we, ways we do it is we set up a counterintelligence network outside the base. And that protects us against foreign intrusions, foreign spies. Now, remember back in those days, we had a Cold War going on. We had Soviets uh, trying to spy on us. And of course, we were trying to spy on them too. So we set up a counterintelligence network around the base, and 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 that involves uh, finding out what the what everybody's doing and what everybody's collecting. And a side note on this is the UFO community. We want to know what the UFO community was doing. We want to know know what information they had, and whether they had been penetrated by Soviet or other hostile intelligence agencies, such as the Chinese or East German, and so forth. So in order to do that, we would have to penetrate uh, those agencies and keep an eye on what and what they were doing and what they were, what were, were gathering. Now, I've never been involved with any in, uh, operations that uh, uh, threatened uh, UFO researchers. Uh, all we did was keep track of what they knew. We never tried to influence them. At least I never did. But we had to keep track of what they what they were doing and and what they knew. And 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 an example of this is Bill Moore. Uh, I mean, most people following the uh, phenomena, UFO phenomena, back in the uh, late seventies and eighties know Bill Moore. He wrote he wrote the first book on Roswell. Him and and Charles Berlitz. Uh, I think it was a very very good book. Uh, one of one of the the few things that people don't know. Uh, is that there's a lot of information about Roswell that Bill had had found out about that wasn't in the book, and there's reasons why it was never uh, never made it made it into the book. But besides that, we we recruited uh, Bill Moore because he was a member of um, Mufon, APRO, Cause, and uh, he, kept, he kept track of what they knew, and he told us what they knew. But at no time did we ever influence. Uh, I never broke into any uh, Mufon uh, uh, members' houses. Uh, I know, I know what that's. I know why you said that, and we'll talk about Paul Benowitz in a in a little bit. But um, so we just kept track of it. Now Bill Moore had other other uh, connections with us, and that dealt with counter espionage because he had a, he had information uh, pertaining to, and he had contacts uh, within the Soviet Union. And so that's that's a dis different uh, program, so to speak. But uh, we never broke into any. I didn't. OSI never broke into any uh, researchers, MUFON or APRO or causes uh, residences and, and and stole information. We never bullied them. We never threatened them. Uh, that's all made up in 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 the press. Okay. Yeah. No problem. So I mean, let's talk about Paul Benowitz because. Unfortunately, people do associate the disinformation and your um, interactions with him to to be an influence on what happened to him. So can you break that down and, and sort of lay it out to us how, how it really went down or, or your side of things? Well, Paul Benowitz uh, was a uh, he owned a a, uh, a company right, right outside the base of uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, it was called Sci Thunder Scientific Laboratories. He made uh, environmental sensors for uh, U.S. submarines. So he had a, 
industrial security clearance. He had, uh, and he, he made sensitive things for the government, of the United States government, not just the sensors for the submarines, but uh, other things for the United States Navy. He lived right outside the base, right outside uh, one of the largest nuclear weapon storage areas in the free world. And he started seeing objects flying around the base, Kirtland Air Force Base. So he was photographing those objects. He also set up uh, uh, scientific uh, collection uh, devices. Now, Paul Benowitz was a physicist. He was a scientist. And eventually he thought there was a threat to the base. So he went to uh, the, uh, the chief of security for Manzano Base, which was where the nuclear weapons uh, were stored. The, uh, the person he contacted was a little Lieutenant, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Ernie Edwards. And he told Ernie Edwards about what he was seeing uh, near the base. Well, uh, me being the counterintelligence officer for the base, uh, Ernie Edwards, and I knew him very well. He attended most of our security meetings. He immediately called me and said, listen, uh, Rick, I need you to come down to the office. I have something very, very important to tell, tell you. So I did. I went down there and he briefed me on a Paul Benowitz, what Paul Benowitz told him. We immediately started an investigation because there was uh, there was a uh, indication of a threat to the base. Uh, Paul saw these things flying around. We didn't know what they were. I mean, at least I hadn't been briefed into that program. So we, uh, myself and another uh, person, went out to Paul Benowitz's uh, uh, office out at Sci uh, Thunder Scientific uh, uh, Laboratories. I introduced myself. As a counterintelligence officer, I didn't hide anything. I said, you, you provided information to uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ernie Edwards, and we're interested in what you, you had. Well, Paul opened up. Paul uh, completely uh, uh, opened up about what he was doing, what he saw, what he photographed, showed us the photographs, uh, thought there was a threat. Uh, Paul had served in the United States Navy. He was a patriotic American. He had a, a scientific laboratory that provided very sensitive electronic devices to the United States Navy. Uh, so he was concerned. He was he was really concerned. Um, now, a side note about Paul. Paul had been a member of APRO since 1960. Paul was a strong believer in UFOs, alien contacts. So he already knew this. He already knew about aliens. He, after a couple of meetings with Paul, he, he connected what he was seeing with ETs or extraterrestrials. So that's how that connection occurred. Now, what Paul was actually filming, and this is not classified anymore, were the uh, United States Air Force's drone program. We started a drone program the Air Force did back in the late uh, 70s and early 80s. And the way that the uh, drones were uh, tested back in those days was there would be an airplane flying, a mother mothership, so to speak. And these uh, drones would fly out of the airplane, the Air Force plane, and being controlled by operators with inside that plane, that close proximity. And so what Paul was taking pictures of were these drones flying around this airplane, an Air Force plane, and 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 Pa immediately thought that there were UFOs flying around a, a, a an Air Force plane. We never told Pa initially. Uh, we didn't tell him initially. Eventually, we did, but not initially. We didn't tell him that it was an Air Force project. At that time, that drone program was highly classified, highly classified. So we didn't tell him that. Now, a few other things, Pa. Uh, delved into uh, was that uh, we had a uh, national security agency site on the base. And that uh, site was highly classified. The fact that it was there was classified. It, it's not classified anymore. Not a, anything I'm telling you now is not classified. Uh, Paul was photographing strange occurrences coming from that national security agency to their NSA site. And he also collected signal or intelligent uh, signal uh, frequencies coming from there. And what Paul uh, 
accidentally, I think, uh, got himself into or tapped into was a highly class, another highly classified program where we were firing a laser up in the sky and blinding Soviet satellites as they were going over the area of the base. And uh, it's not classified anymore, uh, but, but at that time, obviously it was. So putting all those things together, we had to convince Paul, we didn't want to release the fact that he tapped into a two highly classified programs. So I suggested to Paul that maybe what he was seeing were real UFOs, alien spaceships. And, and I, it didn't take much to convince him otherwise because he already believed it. That's how uh, the disinformation started with Paul. I didn't have to fool him. I didn't have to present him with anything. I just had to put that suggestion in his mind. Me and others. There were other people involved in this. And uh, and Paul ran with it. And I, we told Paul, listen, this is classified, Paul. You can't tell anybody. Well, well, he didn't. We accept with exception of a few people such as uh, Alan Heineck, uh, he who was involved in this program, and some others. But uh, that's how the Paul Benowitz uh, uh, project occurred. No, I appreciate you giving us the giving us that. And just before we move on, the two programs, the classified programs that you mentioned, the laser and the drone. Do you happen to know the code names for either of those projects? Uh, the uh, drone program. Um, was amber something and i i don't i don't remember the nsa program uh, the nsa uh uh project uh it was an nsa code name for it but uh well at the time i didn't know what it was i sure. had to get briefed into the program with nsa and that of course presented a lot of problems because when we when we briefed nsa uh security uh they immediately began their own investigation unbeknownst to us they had a parallel investigation going on as we did. Now, our investigation involved the FBI because um, we the FBI is responsible for any type of uh, espionage occurring in the United States. So we had to bring the FBI in. On this. And the NSA didn't. NSA had a, a purely uh, secretive uh, investigation program. And so uh, I eventually got briefed into it, but it took some time to do that. No, that's fair enough. Um, now, I mean, I suppose you didn't know what the outcome would be when it came to Paul Benowitz, but I mean, I suppose at the end of it, did you feel any kind of guilt or regret or, how, or of even being a part in, in what happened to him? Like, how, how did it make you feel? Well, the Paul Benowitz case, uh, it was his project was called Seven Lambs. Seven Lambs. That was the investigation of Paul Benowitz. Uh, and that's been released uh, before. Um, there are, the, there, there are a lot of other things that occurred regarding this project and this investigation that just that. Uh, Paul Benowitz was a pilot. Uh, he flew uh, uh, his own Cessna, a single engine uh, Cessna 182, and he flew around taking pictures. Well, Paul actually photographed some real UFOs, which uh, he, he came back and showed us. He had his own la uh, photo lab. So he developed his own photos and showed us these things. Um, Paul also was given a, uh, a monitor, uh, a computer monitor by Alan Hynek, unbeknownst to us. And that computer monitor was uh, strange in itself because back in those days, in the 1980s, Commodore made uh, a computer, a small a computer, but didn't make anything in color. Well, somehow Paul got his, he got color. He was taking screenshots with his camera of, of colored photographs on his computer. We don't know how he did that. In fact, we eventually uh, took the, took it, seized this, his, his uh, computer monitor and tried to figure out how that worked. Uh, Paul thought all along that he had contact with ETs, that he was getting strange, uh, signals, uh, strain writings, alpha, uh, he calls it the alien alphabet. Um, and he was taking camera shots. I shouldn't say screenshots, but he said camera shots of him. 
And so we, we had that, we, we had to deal with that, trying to figure out what he was doing, how he was uh, seeing these things uh, and whether in fact, maybe he really was in contact with ETs. And then on the other side of this uh, was the other complex investigation involving one of his employees who actually had contacts with a, uh, a foreign government. So we had an espionage investigation going on. So all those things dealt into the Paul Benowitz story, which the, the investigation lasted seven years. Uh, eventually ended. Uh, I maintained friendship with Paul all during this time period. I eventually told Paul, you know, what you were seeing was something, you know, what, what you initially were seeing, the photographs you were seeing came from uh, a drone program and another highly classified program. Well, he wouldn't believe me. He goes, no, you don't have to tell me. I know they're UFOs. He, he would never believe anything other than what he, uh, regarding the UFOs. Um, now, you, you spoke earlier about breaking into people's houses. Paul Benowitz, uh, during this investigation, gave us carte blanche um, permission to enter his residence anytime we needed to. He gave us his key. He gave us a written document saying, yeah, you can go in anytime you want to. We did. We did do that. In initial phases of our investigation, we wanted to make sure Paul wasn't making all this up. And there were a number of things happened and we saw, uh, which maybe I can talk about later, uh, that, that made me think that uh, there was something to what Paul was saying about his house being uh, monitored by something that could very well have been extraterrestrial. But uh, that's how we entered his home. It was we he gave us permission to do that? Oh, lost you there for a second. Sorry. Sorry, I think you're back now. Um, well, listen, I appreciate you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Go okay, ahead. great. No worries. No worries. I wasn't sure if we'd frozen or anything. Um, now, again, I appreciate you you uh, giving us the the, the lowdown on that. But now, the next thing I'd like to speak about is the aviary. Um, so. I've got a few questions before we do so. Can you just give us a breakdown of how that came about, if you don't mind? Well, the aviary uh, was a special group of people. Now we didn't name it aviary. We, we had it. We had this special group of people that met uh, beginning in the 1980s, early, but 1980 actually, uh, October 1980, and we met. Uh, I was. Uh, brought into it uh, as a, a neophyte. I mean, I was just young uh, intelligence officer, uh, didn't know much about the subject. There were a lot of people that were brought into this uh, group that were uh, seasoned intelligence officers. Um, the leader of our group was Richard Helms, who was a former uh, director of Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, he wasn't uh, involved uh, directly with the government at that time. And there were a number of other people that brought, were brought in, Kit Green, Dr. Hal Putoff, uh, and, and a number of other people. And, uh, and our job was trying to figure out how we can disclose the subject to the public in a common sense manner that would not, number one, endanger national security, release anything that was classified and not upset the public. And so that's what our goal was. We met periodically about every three months or so. Uh, we were quasi government. We were supported by the government uh, indirectly. And we uh, reported to the government and we, uh, the government kept track of, of us. Now, <clears throat> Bill Moore and a guy by the name of uh, Jamie Shandera learned about the group. They're the, they're the ones that named us bird names. Right. So the aviary, uh, we, you know, we weren't no, no, known as the aviary within our group. We were, we were just a working group. And, uh, and, 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 we, uh, and that's what we did. Uh, sometime in the uh, uh, 84 or 85, uh, I met with Bill Moore, who told me about this group. <laughs> and I said, well, 
uh, he said, you guys have names. And then he, and that's how the aviary came into existence as far as the public's knowledge of what the aviary was. Now, I just wondered if I go through the list of members, you'd be able to give me an indication or an idea of their relation to the UFO subject going into the, the formation of the group in the 80s. So so Richard Helms, you know, what, what was his interest or was he working within the, you know, the government on UFOs before the aviary? Richard Helms was, uh, you know, he came into the agency at the beginning of the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, he was uh, involved in uh, uh, Army intelligence prior to that and the uh, Office of Strategic Intelligence. Um, and uh, he was a, uh, uh, a station chief. He, he, he worked his way up through the CIA. Um, he had been briefed on a couple of different programs that the Central Intelligence Agency had that were dealt with the UFOs. He didn't, ha he didn't have full access. He always told us he had, he was 50. He was 50-50, meaning he had 50% knowledge of the subject and 50% not uh, information he wish he had. So he was 50-50, 50, 50. 50 in, 50 out. Anyways, uh, eventually over the years, uh, he became more involved in a program. But of course, uh, he got uh, uh, into to, to the, to the dark side of the program, so to speak when um, the agency was investigated in the, four, in the 70s um, regard of, uh, in, in regards to assassinations and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and then eventually he got out of the agency. Uh, he retired. But he uh, maintained contact. And uh, I don't exactly know who uh, selected him as the leader of the Avery, but um, when I uh, was uh, brought into it, uh, Richard Helms was was the uh, the the uh, leader of our of our group. Uh, and then so we're moving he, on. Sorry, he on. had he had knowledge of the subject. In fact, when we were when we were being uh, briefed at these meetings, he had uh, intimate knowledge of of the subject matter. So yeah, he he knew. Uh, moving on to Kit Green. What, what were you aware of regarding UFOs and Kit Green in 1980? Uh, well, first of all, Dr. Green and I worked on uh, classified broker programs together. I, I, know, I knew Kit for a good many years. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, he was a, he's a doctor, a medical doctor, and he was involved with remote viewing uh, uh, with Dr. Putoff back in the uh, 70s. And Kit Green had been briefed into the program on the medical side of it, medical knowledge. So that was his connection to the Avery. Yeah. And I suppose um, moving on next would be, well, let's deal with Hal Putoff then, because you mentioned him there. So I suppose, is that a similar vein to Kit Green, you know, uh, SRI, DIA, CIA, that kind of connection? Yes. Dr. Putoff was a... Uh, an, uh, he was in the Navy. He was a physicist in the Navy, worked on lasers way back in the 60s. Uh, he eventually went to Sanford, uh, got involved in SDI, the, the remote viewing program, on the scientific side of it, not on the remote viewing side, not on the paranormal side of it. Um, and um, he uh, was one of the chiefs involved in the, uh, the, in the uh, setting up the remote viewing program for the military and for the intelligence community. And so he uh, had knowledge because of, of his work, uh, both in the remote viewing, uh, the fact that they had remote viewers that were <clears throat> remote viewing uh, the moon and Mars and spaceships flying around earth. So he had knowledge of that. Uh, it, 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 but I, <clears throat> I didn't know everything that, that, uh, Dr. Putoff was working on back in those days, but I knew he had knowledge of the subject. Excellent. I've just got a quick question here that's kind of relevant to what we're talking about. With regards to Kit Green, he stated he was shown an alien autopsy. Is Are you aware of, of a real autopsy video within the intel circles at that time or, or around then? Yes, there, there, were, uh, there were real uh, autopsies performed and, and the 
um, the uh, ETs that were from the crash, the dead ETs from the crash in Corona, uh, there were autopsies done by the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology on those beings. And then there were other crashes where there were uh, dead ETs that, uh, that there were uh, autopsies. And every one of those were filmed. And, um, I, you know, you, I, I don't want to speak for Dr. Green. I wasn't present when these, and, and I don't know exactly what he saw, but I'm sure he had access to those. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, moving on. What about Bruce Maccabee? What was his connection to the UFO subject? Bruce Maccabee was a, uh, optical scientist and, um, he had, uh, his access was uh, more in line with technology, uh, understanding the, the, the technology from uh, uh, extraterrestrial crafts. That was his, uh, his knowledge. Brilliant. Uh, Ron Pandolfi. Ron Pandolfi was within the central, he was a CIA uh, officer. Uh, he was in a paranormal, sat in a paranormal desk at the CIA. And so he had, uh, he certainly had knowledge of the, of the subject. Uh, he had been briefed into the program and uh, he had the, uh, he was more or less a representative of some, from the CIA on the, on the, in the group. Brilliant. Uh, someone who I don't think many people might not have heard of is Ernie Kellerstrauss. Ernie Kellerstrauss was a, a um, an air force uh, scientist uh, who had, um, knowledge about technical uh, uh, projects that the government was working on in the reverse engineering program. Is it right? Am I right in saying that he'd examined UFO artifacts then in that program? Yes, 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 he did. Brilliant. Uh, Captain Robert Collins. Uh, Captain Robert Collins was a, um, a scientist, Air Force scientist at the um, at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and he had had access to uh, some of the artifacts that they had taken off ET crafts uh, that were that were being examined at the Wright Patterson, uh, uh, the Institute for, uh, I think, the Air Force uh, Institute of of uh, Technology, and that's where he was, and that's where the uh, the the some of these items were taken, and back in back in forties, uh, the only the only place that that uh, were de was dealing in the subject uh, was at Wright Patterson Field, at Wright Field, and uh, so a lot of these uh, uh, artifacts were taken there. Now we had Los Alamos National Laboratories, but they were more or less in the nuclear arena, not in the technology arena. Initially, I think most, uh, and don't quote me on this, but I think most of the the uh, devices that we didn't understand was taken to Wright Patterson. Right, lovely. Uh, Dan Smith. Dan Smith was a civilian, and he was um, <clears throat> he was an in between, a go between. He was somebody we used to get information from the outside, and that's. I'll just leave it at that. No problem. Am I right saying he was a civilian UFO researcher? Yes, yes, you're correct. Excellent. Um, Colonel John Alexander. Colonel John Alexander was a uh, United States Army uh, officer involved in highly classified projects, uh, both within the Army's um, Institute of Advanced Technology and at, uh, at Los Alamos. And so he was involved in a lot of different aspects of the subject of UFOs. Uh, and I'll just leave that, that, that. No problem. And then finally, I've got Commander CB Scott Jones. Scott Jones was a, a reserve uh, United States Navy commander. He was an aide to Senator uh, Claiborne Pell uh, of Rhode Island. And Senator... Pell was the was um, our 
uh, connection with the United States Senate and funding. Uh, if we needed something uh, as far as money or, or, or other things, uh, he could um, satisfy us, uh, satisfy our needs, so to speak. And, 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 and uh, mm -hmm. Scott Jones was uh, Senator Pell's aide, chief, uh, chief of staff. Uh, so that's, that's how uh, uh, Scott was involved in this. Lovely. And am I right in saying that uh, Harry Reid was somehow in discussions with the group at some point? Was there, there was a connection somewhere with ha Harry Reid? Harry Reid didn't come into to, 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 uh, existence within the Avery area until the early 2000s. Okay. Yeah, they, but he, he, uh, back in the 80s, I'm not really sure. I think he was a, uh, um, a lawyer in Nevada at the time, or in Washington, D.C., but... No, he wasn't involved until later. And but Harry Reid was the late yeah. Harry Reid. He he was involved in in the subject later on. Yes, yes. Now let me uh, let me say that that the, the names that you gave me are just a few of the names are involved. There's many others that are involved that that you, you don't have names to, and uh, and so uh, and some of some of the other people are uh, were. Um, uh, temporary members, like they came in for a particular reason and then got out. Uh, so there were 18 total um, that we had we had uh, brought in and out of the group over the years. Are you able to give us any of those names that I haven't said? No, I'm. I'm uh, and there's a reason. Uh, some of them are still involved. Okay. And, 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 and a, let me, let me just say this, and this is about all I can say about it. The Avery still exists. Still out there. Interesting. Not necessarily with the same people. Okay. Because obviously still... some of them have died over the years and so forth. And this is sanctioned by the government or within military or the intelligence community. Within, I would say within the intelligence community interesting very interesting um i'm just going to bring this question up here from sean so what stopped the avery group from disclosing as that was the goal well it was a complicated process we had to number one we had to, we had to create a plan i mean everything within government is done by a plan i mean you had to do a written plan and we did we had a very very i thought and I was a neophyte. I was just a young guy. You know, I was, you know, 27, 28 years old. Uh, I, I, I wasn't the senior person, obviously. I was a very low person in that group. But I had jobs and things I had to do, and I did it. A uh, senior representative in the group, uh, they've created a plan, an operational plan, on how we should proceed with disclosure. and. But it was so complicated that you had to get uh, so many different agencies to agree to it. Now, you understand from 1947, uh, when, when, when the Roswell craft crashed in 1947, the second craft in 1949. But in 1947, we didn't have an Air Force. We had, and we didn't have an intelligence community. We didn't have a CIA. We had the, uh, the Army Air Force. Uh, we had still had uh, the army actually took over the OSS, so their intelligence uh, was coming from the from the army. Uh, the National Security Act was passed in September of 1947, the creation of the United States Air Force and a Central Intelligence Agency. But the CIA never actually got off the ground until '51. I mean, it took some years to form it and so forth. So we had we had a deal with some some older operational plans that were in place after the Roswell craft crashed. And then in 1960, the DIA came into existence, the Defense Intelligence Agency. And, 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 and just bear with me on this, okay? I'm giving some sure. historical paper. In 1969, the United States Air Force wanted to get out of it. The Air Force says, listen, we don't want this program 
we the UFO, the Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, Project Sign, the Air Force had. We we wanted to get out of it, so they uh, created this condom report, and it was actually written by the Air Force. I think most people, any kind of common sense, can can figure it out that it wasn't done by condom. It was his name stuck to the report. Uh, it, the Air Force wrote it to get out of it. But the Air Force had to find some agency to take it over. The DIA, relatively new agency, 10 years old or nine years old, raised her hand and said, we'll take it. We got to have something to do. So all this was given over to the DIA. Now, if it would have stayed in the DIA during that time period, um, I think we could have had a disclosure. But what happened was the Navy became involved in this, Office of Naval Intelligence. And then the, the o, o and I uh, were collect, was collecting information about the subject of UFOs, incidents uh, involving Navy, just the Navy, and never sharing it with the DIA, keeping it in-house. And, of course, the Air Force... 1971 decided, you know, this could be a threat to national security, so we have to keep involved in this. So now the Air Force is involved in it, and they're not sharing their information with the DIA. So now you got all these different agencies involved in this. And now when we become a quasi entity of the government that wants the disclosure, we had to, we have to uh, uh, coordinate all this with all these different agencies. Now, again, in 1980 time period, we had the National Reconnaissance Office, NRO. They're involved in it. Uh, they're not sharing with anybody but certain members of the Air Force because they're getting their funding directly from the Air Force. That was a complicated uh, description of it. And that's why we were not able to fully uh, it, be able to implement our, our program or operational plan for disclosure. And another problem we had, what, how much disclosure could we give? Now, are we going to give everything to the American public? No, we can't. We're not going to give technical information. You know, all the, all the neat things that we um, found out in reverse engineering we don't want the Russians or the Soviets back in those days or the Red Chinese or any other hostile intelligence or governments to know about what we know about or what we found out. So we couldn't tell them anything technical. What about the religious aspect of it? I think that scared everybody the most. What if we said, OK, you know, yeah, something came here uh, in 1947. And we had a live alien and he told us that he'd been visiting Earth for 2000 years and he was here 2000 years ago. What's the immediately thought, the thinking process of somebody that's religion, religious? Oh, my God. Did, did, the, did the alien put Jesus on Earth? So that that uh, plant played into our, our, our problem with disclosure. No, fair enough. Um, great question here by Jay Allen, which is also on my list. Is um, what are your thoughts on Bob Lazar's story? Well, I was at Area Fifty One. I was a counterintelligence officer. I think it's you know, there's there's smarter people out there who figured that out. Uh, even Phil Class uh, got some records. Anyways, I was a, I was a counterintelligence officer out there. I knew about S two, not S four. Um, the problem with uh, uh, Bob Lazar's story is that S4 was under, was a fourth level under S2. The complex is called S2. It's S meaning site, site two. Uh, and S4 was a fourth level. Uh, I was at S2 a number of times. Uh, that's administrative control uh, operations for at the, the lower levels. I was never at S4, never was down in S4, never saw what was down in S4. I just didn't have a clearance or didn't have a need to know. When Bob, Stor Bob Lazar's story came out in 1969, 
uh, 50, uh, excuse me, 89. Um, I checked with one of the chief of securities out there who uh, was very, very, very close to me. I mean, I, I just left the intelligence community and, and he checked and yeah, Bob Lazar did work out there. I think it was only for 96 days or 95, something like that, 98 days or something, that, something like that. He did work out there. Uh, he, did have access, he did have access to S4. But that's the only thing I can say. I don't know anything else about what he saw uh, or what he did down there. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to move on to a few questions I've got here from uh, I've sent in by different followers on social media. So first of all, Yorne asks, why has the military or whoever did fake alien abductions? What was the point of doing that? Uh, <clears throat> probably my weakest area um, is, is abductions. Uh, I know we investigated them. I investigated some abductions. Um, I don't know about any actual United States government abductions. So no uh, my labs or anything like that. Um, there were there. Uh, let me say this: there were uh, some specific operations that occurred to protect uh, other projects. Uh, we had, and I'll give you an example. Okay, there was an Air Force uh, major who had access to a, a program and uh, highly classified, and he started to uh, disclose it to somebody that shouldn't know about it. So we faked an abduction of the person that he was uh, giving the information to, to throw her, it was a female, throw her off. That's the only, that's the only uh, fake abduction that I ever knew about within the, within the, the government. Now, there may have been others. You got to understand there's other agencies working this. The 7602nd Air Intelligence Squadron at uh, Wright Patterson, I mean, at uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, uh, the real, real men in black did some things that I never had access to. So it could have happened, but I only knew of one instance and I told you that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a question from Dave Partridge. On Fade to Black a couple of years ago, you mentioned that there were two disinformation agents that you knew of active within the UFO community one that's been around for years and one younger in comparison. Are you able to disclose who they were or are? No, I think they did. <laughs> I think they disclosed really? themselves. Yeah, a UFO convention some years ago. Uh, one particular one sat in a room and, and said that he had been uh, um, co-opted by a particular a person, uh, an intelligence officer. Not me. He named, a, he named that <laughs> intelligence officer. And... Uh, uh, I, well, the other one, I think everybody knows Bill Moore. I mean, right? Okay. Yeah, Bill Moore was the other one. So the 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 younger one, uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, if he wants, he'd already disclosed his name. Uh, I can't remember what UFO convention that was. Twenty oh six or seven, sometime in there. And then, of course, Bill Moore. We don't I mean, well, We know Bill Moore was the other one of the others. Okay, that's great. No, that's something we can look into. Appreciate it. Um, did you play, this is from uh, Matthew Ilsley, did you play any part in the creation or dissemination of any materials related to Majestic 12? No, absolutely not. I think I was clear to that in 1960, uh, 1987 and 89, uh, FBI investigated it. Uh, and and, and the, uh, the MJ-12 documents contained about... Um, 70% factual information and the other 30%, uh, well, I shouldn't say 30, 20% was maybe speculation and 10% was outright uh, lies, <laughs> false information. But it wasn't, it was created by the government. Uh, I think, you know, this has been out there a long time. People don't want to believe it. 
people want to believe that the MJ-12 document was created by me or Bill Moore or Jamie Shandera or uh, Carl Dale. I mean, all these names were involved in, in creating these documents. Uh, and, and none of it's factual. You know, they write a book and it has to sound good. So they throw my name in there and others. But the, 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 the documents were created for a reason. And uh, it was, you know, I was not involved in that. There were hundreds and hundreds of other people involved in this program besides me. And so other people and, and the agency, the, the entity that created that document, I think uh, Wendell Stevens, and most people know who Wendell Stevens is, he had some really neat documents that uh, suggested this, the, uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency Special Means Committee uh, actually created that document. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the truth. And if you want to believe it, you can believe it. You don't want to believe it, you don't have to believe it. No, fair enough. A um, question from Jay Allen here. Uh, is there an influence operation, Men in Black, to keep people quiet? Is this a shadow game parallel to an actual alien MIB operation? Well, <clears throat> there's an entity called, uh, or there's an organization back in those days called the 7602nd Air Intelligence uh, wing detachment 22 detachment 22 contained some very strange people they were uh people that could speak different languages uh they people that looked differently had different facial appearances some say they had plastic surgery i don't know about that i've, I've never heard that anybody at purposely had their face uh, uh, manipulated in a way, but and some of them were ex uh, safe crackers, actors, actresses. There's men, women. Uh, there's all different races involved in this: uh, African Americans, uh, Hispanic, and they're assigned to this particular detachment. And their job is to collect intelligence, deep cover intelligence operations. And one one of their jobs is the men in black stories. I know I met them. I met some of these people. Uh, they uh, visited witnesses after I did. Uh, so yes, the government does have people. They don't call themselves men in black, but uh, they're out there for a particular reason. Most, uh, most uh, uh, of what they do are really highly classified, super secret stuff that uh, they penetrate foreign governments and it doesn't always it doesn't necessarily pertain to UFOs, any kind of intelligence. Uh, but but there is a there is a, uh, a, a, a an organization that uh, people could could go back and claim to be the men in black, the, the real men in black. Yeah, great. Um, the next question I've actually got a few times was regarding some documents that you showed to Linda Moulton Howe. Now, I'm assuming it's to do with DNA manipulation. So manipulated 65 times in order to create homo sapiens sapiens. Is that, were they true documents? Was that not true? Was it disinformation? Like, can you tell us about those documents? <clears throat> the Linda Howell case, uh, I was given a task. Now, everything I did was sanctioned by the government, obviously, or I would you know, be in jail someplace. Uh, I, was at, I was tasked with contacting Linda Howell uh, because she was a really good researcher and she had contacts within the government that we were worried about. And my job was to meet up with her, uh, get to know her, try to recruit her, number one, and then try to uh, find out who her sources were within Washington, D.C. So I contacted her. I brought her out to the base. I brought her into a very, very secure area. I set her in a particular location where she could be filmed through a one-way mirror. She, she describes this probably better than I do. And I showed her some documents that I had gotten that morning from an Armed Forces Courier, a highly classified document. Armed Forces Courier Service only transports 
highly classified, has to be above, top secret or above. Uh, I, I got it into my office. I looked at, I opened it with my su supervisor present because we both had to sign. And I was to show her those documents. So, and I did that. She came in, she sat down, everything was recorded. I had other people looking in. I gave her the document. I said, you can, you can look at this document. You can read this document. You can't take notes. You can't photograph. As soon as you're done reading it, it goes back in the, the safe folder. And the safe folder is a, is a, is a, a safe a folder that will um, uh, you put a document in. And if you, if you close it in a certain way, if you try to open it in a certain way, the small thermite uh, uh, strips that burns the document. So, uh, and I had to then send it back. So what she read was what I was told, what I was given to tell her to read, showed her. So now you're asking me, is everything in that document real? You'd have to go back and ask the government that because sure. I don't know. I, 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 I read it. It was a thick document and had uh, the complete history of U.S. involvement, including uh, the DNA uh, studies. It was very few people ever had access to that stuff. Um, and so what she read uh, I would, I would assume was factual, at least most of it. And after she was uh, finished reading it, put it back in a container. Uh, then I, I took, she asked me a lot of questions I couldn't answer. And then I took her, took her back uh, off, off the base. Now I maintained contact with Linda Howell for years, but I, we could never recruit her as a, as an asset. She's just too smart. She knew what we were trying to do. She didn't want to tell us sources. And so uh, we just left it at that. And oh, we, we never bugged, we never bugged her car. I mean, I heard, I read this uh, a few months ago or back in November that we were allegedly planted devices in her home. And I, we never did any of that. That's absolutely false. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Jefferson Lee asks, what aerospace corporations do you know that are hiding advanced physics or advanced materials that are allegedly not of human origins? Uh, hmm. That's a, that's a, <clears throat> it's a loaded question. The, um, <laughs> one of the ways the government, United States government hides information is through the contractors. Um, I worked for Dr. Putoff at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin. He had DARPA contracts. And I saw it firsthand there. That's all. I'll just say that. Because I, I can't talk about what I did with, with Dr. Putoff because it's, it's proprietary uh, in his information. So I'm not going to talk, talk about it with the exception that the government hides highly classified reverse engineering uh, projects within contractors because contractors uh, are not subject to FOIA under Title V United States Code. They're exempt. So I would look at e-systems, uh, Skunk Works, um, Tektronics Corporation. There's just a few that I would look at. Brilliant. That's something for people to go on. Um, a question here from Insta Vern. Could you please ask him about deceptive indication or warnings projects or expand on what you know about false, false INW programs? So I guess false flags, if, if anything. Um, yeah, I mean, they occur within the intelligence community. Uh, we sometimes, we used to use uh, the Canadian Secret Service uh, to mask some things. Uh, complicated uh, false flag is um, uh, using other people's identity to uh, to get information, not connecting it back to the, to to, to uh, the, orig the or or originating agency. Uh, that, that's about all I can say about it because a lot of those things are still uh, pretty classified. That's great. Thank you. Now, one final question before we end is you mentioned recently in, in, in a recent interview that you're actually forming a new group. Is that something that you can expand on a bit or at least tell us what the what you what the intentions are? 
Well, we have we have a group. We've had a group uh, of retired intelligence officers. Uh, we've had I've been a member for years, and we're trying to um, work with some other some other entities uh, for a disclosure. But again, we have a it's a, it's it's a very 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 complicated situation. Uh, we, we number one. We have to be very careful that we don't disclose any classified information because we're going to be end up being prosecuted in court. Uh, number two, uh, we can't uh, identify anyone within the intelligence community that is working on these projects because there's a law uh, that, that says you can't disclose an undercover person, an intelligence officer. So you, you can't do that. And we don't want to do that. So um, we're trying to work with Congress. Uh, people like, well, Harry Reid was one, but of course he died. Uh, Marco Rubio, Senator Rubio. Uh, there's a number of different uh, um, senators and congressmen, both on, on both sides of the aisle, both Democrats and Republicans, that we're working with trying to get some legislation passed that could protect people uh, from the, disclosing certain things about the subject. And before we ever uh, disclose what we want to disclose or start a really, really a successful disclosure pro program, we want some laws on our side. And, and that's what we, we have to do first. I appreciate that so much. And Rick, thank you so much. We are out of time, but I really, really say uh, thank you so much for coming on uh, and answering the questions. Um, uh, it's been great. I really appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. You're very welcome. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye bye. Well, guys, thank you so much to everybody here live watching. Uh, I really appreciated all the input, the questions uh, for keeping it nice and mature in the chat. We'll be back next week. But for all details on upcoming shows, you can follow me over on Instagram and on Twitter. All the details are below. But for now, guys, thank you so much. I hope you all have a good rest of your day and I'll see you soon. Take care.